WrestleMania 6 in 1990. This was the moment that Jim Helwig irreversibly changed. Helwig, aka the Ultimate Warrior, was handpicked by Vince McMahon to lead WWE into the new decade, primed to take over from Hulk Hogan as WWE's figurehead. The Ultimate Warrior pinned him and lifted the belt to become the champion, ecstatic that his moment had finally come. At that moment, Jim Helwig became the Ultimate Warrior. The man became indistinguishable from the character. Within months, he would be consumed by his own ego and an obsession with outdoing Hulk Hogan in every way. Within months, he would become one of wrestling's most hated men. Jim Helwig was noted as being an insecure loner of a child before starting bodybuilding, and it was at the gym in his home state that he found a way to measure up to the boys around him, and he exploded in size in his teens. Helwig wasn't interested in any sports like his peers, he just wanted to work out at every available opportunity. In the mid-80s, Helwig competed in amateur bodybuilding contests, winning the 1984 Mr. Georgia Crown. At a bodybuilding contest in 1985, Helwig was scouted for Jerry Jarrett's Continental Wrestling Association, along with Steve Borden, who would later become Sting. And there, he officially entered the wrestling business. Helwig and Borden were paired together in a tag team as the Freedom Fighters, and it's safe to say they absolutely sucked in the ring. Unsurprisingly, the CWA fans rejected them almost immediately. They were turned heel and given legendary manager Dutch Mantel. He said, I managed them for, I don't know, three, four, five weeks or something. They were horrible. They weren't that good. They were worse than horrible. Horrible would have been an upgrade. The pair went to the Universal Wrestling Federation in 1986, where they were repackaged as the Blade Runners, a direct knockoff of the Road Warriors. Immediately, Helwig came across as being self-centred and uninterested in anything but himself, not playing as a team with the rest of the boys in the back. Despite Helwig and Sting being road buddies together at the time, Sting didn't have many kind words to say about his first tag team partner. Jim was a really intense kind of guy. We had different philosophies on wrestling, different philosophies on life. He looked at things in a completely different way than I did. He was always really kind of paranoid. Now, legendary commentator Jim Ross was working for the UWF at the time of the Blade Runners. He said that Helwig was extremely self-centred backstage. He didn't factor into the rest of the roster. He always seemed to be out of place. He was not a locker room savvy guy. Sometimes it just seemed to me like wrestling was plan B or C for him. Not what he set out to be, but the route took him there. He needed the spotlight on him. It became obvious to UWF booker Bill Watts that Helwig wasn't willing to be a team player. He just wasn't listening to any of the advice he was being given to improve, unlike Sting, who in contrast was well-liked backstage and seemed to be a sponge for the business. Sting stayed in the UWF and Helwig had to go it alone. Despite having limited skills in the ring, his physique was incredible and he had an undeniable charisma two characteristics that would get him so far down the road in the business. In 1986, he went down to the Dallas-based World Class Championship Wrestling and adopted the name The Dingo Warrior. After he'd finished a run hammering jobbers, there was no doubt that The Dingo Warrior was over with the fans and his ego started growing fast. The Warrior heard the fans and in his mind placed himself head and shoulders above everyone else on the roster in Dallas and refused to take the opportunity to develop his in-ring skills. He wasn't interested in wrestling, he wanted to be a TV star. His attitude was rubbing everyone up the wrong way already and he was only just getting started. Warrior didn't have to wait for long to develop his TV star aspirations further as WWE came calling in 1987. WWE was the land of the massive egos and the selfish personalities, and it would take a lot longer for Warrior to piss off his peers in New York, but piss them off, he did. 
Vince McMahon was the king of promoting style over substance and the Ultimate Warrior looked incredible and had that undeniable charisma that was plain to see. He couldn't even cut a proper promo, but it didn't matter. Speaking almost total gibberish suited his persona. As WWE pushed the Ultimate Warrior hard, he started to rub the other wrestlers up the wrong way backstage. He said he was difficult to get along with and would get angry easily, and in a business where communication is everything, these were very bad traits to have. The late great Bobby Heenan said, I don't like the Ultimate Warrior. He wasn't raised as a wrestler. He wasn't in the business because he loved wrestling. He was a guy who used to work out and he thought this was easy money. He had a great body and his paint looked good and his hair was long. It all stopped there. Once the bell rang, it was over. He just wasn't an athletic kind of guy to me. He looked like he was clumsy all the time and he wouldn't listen. You'd tell him not to clothesline because I got a bad neck. I jumped up on the apron. I told him to come from behind and run me into the post. So he runs from behind and clotheslines me. Just disrespectful. Warrior quickly got a reputation not just for being difficult to talk to, but difficult to work with in the ring, as out of ignorance he would stiff his opponents during their matches. Jim Cornette said, I'm not trying to be a prick here, but he couldn't wrestle. He couldn't talk. He got over because he looked like a million dollars and the most successful promoter in the world pushed him to the moon. That push would reach its apex at WrestleMania 6 in 1990. Enamoured with the huge reaction the Ultimate Warrior got thanks to his intensity and unique charisma, he was chosen to dethrone Hulk Hogan and lead the Federation into the 1990s. After Warrior won the match and the WWE Championship, the Toronto Skydome exploded. In years, the Ultimate Warrior was the only man allowed to pin Hulk Hogan cleanly, one, two, three, in the middle of the ring. The world was at Warrior's feet, and then he blew it. After the match, he kind of went off on his own for a little bit, just to take it all in, and for him just to give himself a big pat on the back. And he was rich, and now he was the world champion. But that was short-lived, because literally two months after Jim Helwig left, the Ultimate Warrior came home. He became really erratic, he started staying on the road, which he had never done before. He was disconnected, something was off. He seemed altered, he was not well. After calling his hotel room, a woman answered the phone. It wouldn't be long before Warrior's distraught wife had served him with divorce papers. Jake Roberts was lined up to be the next heel challenger to his title. This was the moment Roberts had been waiting for for his entire career. A main event run against the champion meant more money than Roberts had ever made in his life. To his amazement, McMahon asked Roberts to go and ask Warrior for his blessing first, however. I went to his locker room and knocked and he cut a promo on my ass. Told me he didn't care about me, he didn't care about my family, and if he's going to work with me, I had to be on fucking time. I had to be sure not to miss any shots, and I'd better not fuck no damn drug test, yada yada yada. He just ran the riot act, never did look at me in the eyes, just stomped around the room in a circle back and forth, marching around. I'm like, okay. Then he goes, okay, get out. He dismissed me. Unfortunately for Roberts, the Ultimate Warrior would implode before he got the chance to work with him. He decided in his paranoid mind that he wanted everything that Hulk Hogan had. Warrior had come up with a letter to give Vince McMahon outlining his demands, and if he didn't get what he wanted, that he wouldn't appear on TV. Before SummerSlam 1991, Warrior gave McMahon his letter. He would refuse to show up unless he had an equal contract to that of Hulk Hogan. McMahon was quietly furious, but to get Warrior to perform, he temporarily agreed to his demands. After the match at SummerSlam, when Warrior walked back through the hallway, Vince told him to get out of the building. In the court letter from McMahon to Warrior, you could almost feel his seething anger towards him. By 1996, half a decade had gone by and Vince McMahon and WWE were in a very different position, with WCW becoming a real threat to WWE's very existence. 1995 had been WWE's dirt worst year, both creatively and in terms of business, and it looked like a slide into oblivion was a real possibility. McMahon has never been one to hold long-term grudges when it comes to the business, and that certainly was the case in the mid-90s, where he was willing to try anything to get WWE 
back on track. When Kevin Nash and Scott Hall announced they were leaving for WCW in 1996, McMahon realised that there was a huge gap in his roster. Most of the legends he'd built in the late 80s and early 90s, the likes of Hogan and Randy Savage, were already signed to huge contracts with WCW. The size of those contracts he just couldn't match, so he turned to the Warrior to try and recapture his success in the early 90s. McMahon knew that the Warrior still had a huge fan base, and there was still a story to be told after he'd left prematurely all of those years ago. Bruce Pritchard said, I think there was a big part of the audience that maybe thought they would never see him back. So it was a big deal for him to come back, and Warrior had his fans. Warrior had a fan base, but I just, I hated it. Triple H was looking like a prospect in early 1996 and was booked at WrestleMania to take on the Ultimate Warrior. The Warrior's selfish behaviour during the match would piss off Triple H, and more importantly did him no favours with Vince McMahon and WWE's upper management in general. No one expected Triple H to win the contest, but the Warrior did absolutely nothing to put him over. Triple H hit the Warrior with a pedigree which he famously no-sold and jumped straight back up for the Intercontinental title that sucked and ended in a non-finish. Indie House 9 took place on July the 21st, 1996. The show was originally supposed to have the Ultimate Warrior team up with Shawn Michaels and Ahmed Johnson against the heel trio of Vader, Owen Hart and the British Bulldog in the main event. Prior to the show, Warrior had been missing house shows and stopped answering his phone. It was at that point that McMahon cut ties with the Ultimate Warrior once again. The Warrior had managed to burn down the public speaker in which he espoused right-wing negative views about gays and blacks, and incredibly got a third bite at mainstream pro wrestling thanks to Eric Bischoff. That run in 1998 WCW was basically for Hogan to get his win back in an atrocious run that included Warrior being supernatural for the first time in his career, Maybe he'd been in training with Papa Shango. All in all, it's easy to see why the Ultimate Warrior will be a contender for wrestling's most hated. When Vince McMahon and WWE opened their arms again in 2014 for the Warrior to come to WrestleMania 30 and enter the Hall of Fame and rejoin the company as a legend, there was a lot of talk of water passing under the bridge and bygones being bygones. The Ultimate Warrior would pass away two days after WrestleMania 30 on the 8th of April 2014.